What is going on guys, my name is John and welcome back to yet another video. When you play a Pokemon game, there's always something to do. You have the story, side quests, contests, battling, shiny hunting, and even the most daunting task, completing the Pokedex. Ever since X and Y came out, I've tried to complete the Pokedex as much as I can. I realize that there are a ton of other games in the series that I haven't done it for that I'd love to complete. I mean, the slogan is gotta catch them all, so that would make sense to do it, right? I've played through all the games a bunch of times, so I was curious to how fast I could do it. So, starting with Generation 1, we're going to see how fast an average person can complete the Pokedex in red, blue, and yellow. Before we get started, I need to explain a few things about this challenge. There are runs that have been done in this before. As of the day this video uploads, Smurfy has the current world record for the fastest time to catch every Pokemon on one single cartridge. He finished with a time of 1 hour, 40 minutes, and 2 seconds. This run is filled with crazy glitches and takes an insane amount of practice and quick executions to come even close to the 2 hour mark. As for Glitchless, Shenanigans has a Glitchless record of 2 hours, 29 minutes, and 33 seconds. This one is obviously without any glitches, which makes it so you can only obtain 124 of the 151 Pokemon in the game. This one also takes a ton of practice because a lot of Pokemon are set up to be encountered through RNG manipulations to achieve a score like this. But how fast can an average person catch them all, like you and me? Personally, I imagine I could register every Pokemon in the Pokedex in under 10 to 11 hours on one single cartridge with glitches. But where's the fun in that? I want a real challenge. I'm going to use Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow to complete my Pokedex. I set some rules in line to make this only just a lot harder to complete. I actually intended for this to be done with three people playing at the same time, but I'm terrible at making plans with my friends, so I'm doing it by myself. Unlike Smurfy's run, I'm going to be catching each individual Pokemon and have a complete leaving Dex by the time I'm finished. This makes it so I can't just catch a Pokemon and level it up for the Pokedex entry. Like I said, it's catch them all, not catch some of them and then evolve the rest. I also said that no RNG manipulation can be done. I don't know how to do it, and you probably don't either. I vowed to only use the knowledge that I have at my current disposal. The last rule that I set was arguably the worst rule of them all. I had to do this in under 24 hours. This was a totally unnecessary rule, but I figured that giving 8 hours max playtime per game was enough to maybe complete it. I'll let you know ahead of time that I made a ton of mistakes playing, so this can be easily done in less time. Without further ado, let's find out if this is possible. Alright, so we obviously start off with the normal intro stuff about Pokemon. I name my characters Red, Blue, and Yellow for each game, obviously, and I name my rivals after the people I was supposed to make the video with. Uh, I'm, I'm still sorry. Anyways, let's meet Professor Oak and grab our first Pokemon. As you'd expect, Blue grabs Squirtle, Yellow gets the Pikachu that you encounter earlier, and Red gets, you guessed it, the one we all know and love, Bulbasaur. Okay, so I wanted to have Charmander for this playthrough, but choosing Bulbasaur makes the game a lot easier. I'll get to that part a bit later, though. After destroying our rival on all three games, we've obtained the first three Pokémon in our decks. This is gonna be easy. While Red and Yellow are progressing through the storyline, Blue is making the first stop by catching three Pidgeys on the first route. This is technically the second Pokémon registered because we're playing on evolving Bulbasaur and Squirtle. Yellow speeds through the Viridian Forest and heads to the Pokemon Center to buy an escape rope and a bunch of Pokeballs to make this run a lot faster. We head back to the Viridian Forest and head to a trainer that we didn't fight. We walk up to him and press start right after, which puts us in the menu while he's in our sight. I then use the escape rope to teleport away from the battle. We land back in Pewter City and talk to the guide on the right side of the area. He'll give us a very unneeded guide on where Brock's gym is and then walks through a wall. Anyways, we're going to need to head down south and encounter a specific Pokemon to finish this trick. We find a level 3 Rattata and growl at it 6 times until it understands that we're really angry. We defeat it and head back to the exit of Viridian Forest, where we're... Uh... Find a level 1 Nidoking? Well, I caught it in one throw, which is perfect, but it's an insanely low level, so I guess I'll just start training it and... Perfect! Meanwhile on Blue, we just defeated Brock, and Red is still trudging through the Viridian Forest. We need to catch up bad, so let's just forget about Brock. Remember how I said Bulbasaur was going to help us? What we need for Bulbasaur is to be at level 8, and have 16 Tackle and 36 Growl Power Points left. This is going to take a bit because we can't level it up at all, so let's check the progress on the other games for a bit. In Blue, Squirtle is evolving to War Turtle, but we won't count that one just yet, so we're still on our current caught total. Our Nidoking is absolutely obliterating everything in its path, and we're almost to the end of Mount Moon. At this point, we're going to collect the Helix Fossil, which will add to our total once we revive it. 
Okay, so we finally got our Bulbasaur where we need it to be. We're going to talk to the guide again, but at the end of the conversation, we're going to press start and then save the game. When we restart the game, the guide will run away thinking that we're still following them. Now we can totally skip Brock and head to Cerulean City. But we're not even level 10 yet and we have like 6 trainers to fight on this route, plus a couple force trainers in Mount Moon. It's going to take forever to get through this, so we're going to need to find another way. If we go back and talk to the guy with short term memory loss, he'll walk away from you, let you throw on your hiking boots and traverse like a real Pokemon trainer. This glitch allows you to walk mostly anywhere in the game, but stops when you enter either a battle or an entrance to a building or cave. My favorite part about this glitch is that no matter where you go, the guy will chase after you. Wait, please come back, Brock's gonna kill me. I actually need to go into Mount Moon, but we're going to go in style. We can just walk right past the entrance and go into the exit. When we get in there, we'll end up right behind the Fossil Maniac event. Because he's always had to make me choose between one or the other every time, I think it's time we reward ourselves and take both. I'd like to note here that Blue picks up the Moonstone, which is important for the later game. I forgot about while I was running the other game, so I'll come back later and grab them. In Yellow, we finally reach Cerulean City, and our first stop is to grab a special Pokémon. A breeder in the first house has a Bulbasaur that we can gift if our Pikachu is happy. But with our new love destroying the dreams of every trainer in Kanto, we don't need this little rat. What we're gonna do is use it one more time. Because battling a time with Pikachu would take up too much time, if you use items on it, it will increase its happiness. After spamming about 20 potions, we can finally grab our Bulbasaur. Just like Wartortle, we're not gonna count Bulbasaur yet until it evolves. And with that, we can say goodbye to Pikachu. We'll still let him follow us around though. <sighs> Please use me. In blue, we finally snatch the dome fossil so we can grab ourselves a Kabuto. Our next stop is to fight our rival and take on Nugget Bridge, where Red is slowly creeping behind after spending time leveling up. Dom and Dennis are wiping out our underleveled teams, which wastes time, but is still a quick way to gain XP. Out of all the games, Blue had the most unfair moments, like this one right here. <sighs> Red has to do a lot of extra training on top of Mount Moon because of his weakness on Pidgeotto. So let's take a look at Yellow, who is conveniently grabbing the next starter on our list, Charmander. This one's planned to be a Charizard, so we'll add this one later, so the number still stays. I promise we're gonna catch more, I got this guys. Blue finally beat Dom in the Nugget Bridge, which leads us to our next big task. We're going to need to catch an Abra. I think you know where this is going. I planned on catching three, but their catch rate is very low, so one will do for right now. I forgot to mention Cerulean City, we can grab a rare candy. No, 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 here, which is needed later. There is a mandatory one that we had to pick up at the Pokemon Tower, but it's nice to have one ahead of time. Wait a minute, I completely forgot about Yellow. Where are we? We're already on the SSAN? Oh, no, we're already leaving it. At this point, I completely forgot to take on Misty's gym, so we can use the HM from the SSAN, so I'll be right back. While we stomp her out, Blue is going to do something that we did earlier in the run. In the same grass we caught the Abra, we're going to press start right when we encounter the trainer below us. Using Abra to teleport away, we're going to battle a trainer to fix our game. Right after Nugget Bridge, there's a specific trainer that's going to help us out. He has a slowpoke that we need to knock out. After the battle, we teleport back and head to Nugget Bridge. Right when the route changes, our menu will pop up. When we close it out, we'll encounter a wild Mew. It has a pretty decent catch rate, so we'll have no problem adding this one to the squad. This is the last intentional encounter that we have in the entire playthrough, but this glitch can be done with a bunch of different Pokemon. While the other games are having fun, Red is still on the fourth trainer on the Nugget Bridge. We'll catch up soon. Uh, I hope. Being the lucky game that it is, Yellow gets the lock combination on the first try and destroys Lieutenant Surge's only Pokemon. Yeah, you thought this was just going to be the Pikachu from the anime, right? If you happen to be following along or struggle with this gym, the first lock can be inside every odd number can starting from the top left, and the second lock is somewhere near the first one. Now that we've collected the Thunder Badge, Officer Jenny will give us a Squirtle she captured. This is the one that's meant to be a War Turtle, so he's pretty useless for right now. Moving forwards, we head to the Rock Tunnel. Yellow has a pretty easy time finding the path through here because it was my third time going through it, but we're going to get pretty lost in the other games. This is the point where you can really see how helpful Nidoking really is. While Red is heading to Vermilion City to get on the SSN, and Blue is just getting to Bill, Yellow is already heading to Celadon City to do our next set of important tasks. After skipping trainers and taking the underground path, we're going to grab another Pokemon on the list, Eevee. Unlike the starters, the evolutions are going to match the game's color, so this one is going to be Jolteon at some point. 
While we're in Celadon, it's a good time to grab our evolution stones that we need, and a polka doll is a souvenir to help the other games catch up by a few seconds. Last thing we're going to need is a drink from the vending machine at the rooftop. This is just a story base for the game, but it will help us grab a few mandatory Pokemon, but we'll get to that later. Our last important task is grabbing the TM for Fly to speed things up even faster. What I don't have is a Pokemon to use Fly, which is why to the right of this event we can catch a Spearow. It was the first encounter which really couldn't have gone any better. After catching it and teaching a Fly, we're heading back to Lavender Town to take on our next rival battle against myself. But how are the other games doing? Red is coincidentally fighting Dennis on the SSN, and Wartortle is still taking on Misty's Starmie. You're making it real hard for me, Wartortle. You're making it real hard. After defeating her, I reach what becomes the first big mess up of the run through. I put down in my notes that I need to encounter Jigglypuff on Route 5. The issue is that Jigglypuff is only on Route 5 in yellow, and I need to catch it all the way before Mount Moon in this game. It was at this point that I decided to stop catching Pokemon as I'm playing through the story. I don't have a lot of money as is, and spending time on Pokemon I know I can catch a lot easier in the late game seemed like a much better choice. But because I played blue first, I still went for some of them, but as you can see how far ahead red is, I stopped for the most part. Going back to our Speed King, Nidoking turned all the ghosts in the tower to ghost ghosts and encountered the Marowak at the top of the stairs. Oh wait, I totally forgot to grab the self scope. Conveniently, I still have that little souvenir that we bought earlier. If we use the Poké Doll in battle, it completes the battle and I don't have to do the entire Rocket Game Corner section. This saves about 10 to 15 minutes of game time. After defeating anime number 1 and number 2 and collecting the Poké Flute, we can head to our final big area of the game. Uh, mm. After losing to Dennis four times, we're in Lieutenant Surge's gym trying to salvage our terrible time. Unlike Yellow, the battle for this is three Pokémon instead of one, so it will take a bit longer than the others. Yellow has really given the Silver Spoon on this one. Blue still hasn't reached Vermilion City yet, so let's just leave him alone. He gets nervous when people watch him play. Back to Yellow, we're putting that Pokéflu to use to catch ourselves a Snorlax. I'm honestly surprised that I caught it considering I only had five Pokéballs and nothing to hit it with. It's still beyond me how you can completely miss a Pokemon as fat as this one, but we managed to add another to the decks. I then realized I can skip every trainer on the route to the left of Celadon City to get to Fuchsia, so I took a trip on the old dead bird to the bike path to save a lot of hassle. In blue we're at Route 11 catching two drowsies that we need, and then fish for two Magikarp after getting the old rod. We still have to go through the SSN and get the Thunder Badge, so we'll check back in like 20 minutes. After beating Koga's weird Venonat fetish and getting the Soul Badge so we can use Surf, we head to Safari Zone to actually obtain Surf so we can travel anywhere. <laughs> Where's your Poké Doll now? Now I had planned to catch my Nidorans on the right of Cerulean City, but since I was already here, I grabbed one male, one female, and Rhyhorn before I ran out of steps. I had to fly back to Pewter to grab the old Amber from the museum and surf to Cinnabar Island to revive it. This adds both Ammonite and Aerodactyl to our dex counter. I think we should take a break on Yellow and come back when Red and Blue have caught up. We've completed pretty much all the story and Blue is still rummaging through garbage for two light switches. Seriously though, why did they think this was a good gem? Fortunately, this is where things start to really pick up. Red claws his way out of Rock Tunnel and is heading to Celadon City to grab our second Eevee. This one's gonna be a Flareon. After being at Rock Tunnel for almost 30 minutes being lost, Blue has to head to the left of Lavender Town to grab two Meowth, and then head to Celadon to grab the second to last Eevee. The coin case is going to be needed for Red and Blue, so now it's a good time to grab it while we're getting the Evolution Stones. On the way back, I grab the two Vulpix I didn't encounter to bring up that counter. While we're on the bottom floor fighting our rival, Red has just beat the last run and is ready to claim the Pokeflute. The next section of events are pretty similar to what happened in Pokemon Yellow. About 20 minutes past that point, Red is just about to fight Koga. At this point I used a rare candy to get Ivysaur to Venusaur. After spamming Sand Attack and having his last Pokemon blow up in fear of a rabbit, we barely made it to be able to use Surf. I ended up catching a Snorlax in this game because I needed a Pokemon to Surf with. After reaching Cinnabar Island, we really start to make the game weird. The first thing we need to do is go back to Viridian City. We're going to talk to the old man who is going to teach us how to catch Pokemon because my brain was fried at this point so I forgot how to play. After relearning how to play Pokemon, I flew back to Cinnabar Island to continue my journey. At this point I'm rearranging my rare candies in the 6th slot in my bag. This should give me the result that I'm looking for. All we have to do is surf on the shore and... 
Whoa. Wait a second, that's actually not what I meant to do. This glitch was actually supposed to make it so you encounter Missing No. When you do, it increases the amount of items that you have in your 6 bag slot. Come to find out that if you have a trainer name set as Red, you have a 1 in 5 chance of encountering a Mewtwo at level 132. For some reason, it doesn't know any attacking moves, so we're free to run it down until we catch it. Thankfully, I had a Venusaur with Poison Powder and Leech Seed to bring its health down. Because it was poisoned, it had approximately a 10% chance of being caught. I'm not sure if his overflowed level increased his chances, but we saved an insane amount of time regardless. Now we don't even have to challenge the Elite Four to catch them all. Right around this time, Koga still doesn't understand how to battle and forks over the Soul Badge in blue. We are officially caught up with Red. Back on Red, we're still on the shore to find... this. After we run away from that horrid thing, if we check the 6th slot, we have rare candies in the amount of Triangle 9. Is it a mountain? A slide? Who knows, either way, we have a lot of rare candies. We do the glitch for nuggets for future situations. I realize that Mewtwo doesn't look like a legit Mewtwo, considering that it's at a level that doesn't actually exist. So what I did was give it a super small amount of XP like I did to Nidoking, and boom, level 100. The only problem now is that its HP looks like... Uh, this. I'm sure it'll fix later. Please help me. Uh, let's check on Blue. Okay, maybe not. Now let's put this broken system to use. I spent a majority of the rare candies to get to War Turtle to finally evolve into Blastoise. But why stop there? I leveled them all the way to 100. This way, nothing can stop me from achieving my really sad goal. In red, I flew to the Celadon Mart to sell my nuggets for a cool 150,000 and then bought some TM so Mewtwo is actually useful. I headed over to Saffron City to grab the Psychic TM to finish it all off. Right as I reach this mark, my in-game time or IGT is at about 3 hours and 35 minutes or around 4 hours in real time. Blue is sitting at 350 IGT with about 10 minutes extra IRL. Yellow is a smooth and coincidental 151 which is like 2 minutes off the recording time. Everyone is finally all caught up, and it only took two extra hours to do so. Considering we're halfway to running out of time, I figured here would be a good place to stop the video. On the next episode, we're going to find out how long it will take for me to finish this challenge. Or not finish this challenge in time. We're at the current total of 19 Pokemon, which is... Oh, wait. Yeah, wow, that's actually really awful. But that doesn't mean we still don't have a chance. Do you think I finished the challenge? Leave your responses in the comment section below. If you like the video, leave a like because I'll be putting out more videos soon. If you have any suggestions for videos you'd like to see, leave them in the comments below. Other than that, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one.